So the genesis of this discussion actually started <clears throat> at Genentech, uh, who approached me with a preliminary deck that was unbranded and not uh, related to any product about educating fellows, that was the, the aim of this, as to what happens after you write the prescription, and hence the title. <clears throat> I've given this discussion at a number of training programs around the country very with good, with good uh, reception. First, let's see if I can, uh, usual disclaimers that it is in compliance with the Genentech policy. It is not uh, branded and I am compensated. So we're going to talk about um, uh, what happens after you write the prescription. How many of you have, a, have an idea of what happens when your patient receives that slip of paper in their hand what has to occur between that moment and the time they actually get the medication by pill or infusion or self-injection? Do you have any idea of the process that takes place in your center? So that's what we're really gonna talk about. <clears throat> in the old days, meaning back when I was in your position, we would write a prescription, hand it to the patient, the patient would go to their neighborhood pharmacy they would see Doc or Mr. Green, who was the pharmacist who knew their parents and their grandparents. They would fill the prescription, they would take it home, and they would take their medication. <clears throat> that was the process. That, of course, was when medications were relatively reasonable and relatively simple, small molecules. In the last, I guess since 1998, when the first injectable biologic came out, the cost of these medicines has increased, obviously, dramatically. So the whole process in obtaining the medication uh, for the patient has become what I call obstacleized. And we're going to talk about how we and you will deal with those obstacles from the time you write that prescription until the time the patient can get the medication. Uh, and we're going to do that in a stepwise fashion. Um, my glasses aren't so good, I can't see this, but the first step is determining the coverage. So we're going to have to decide whether that medication fits that patient's insurance company formulary. And I'll digress a little bit. Every insurance company, <clears throat> through a system, through an organization called the PBM, which we'll, we'll cover in some detail, has a formulary in which they decide what, which one of our medicines or which group they are going to cover. And that decision has nothing to do with medical or scientific data. That decision is based strictly on what kind of contract they negotiate with the manufacturer to cover the product and what kind of rebates they get in that product. The better the contract, the more likely the, it, the the medication will get on the formulary, and the more likely it will be in a favorable position, a tier, tier one, two, three, and four. Tier one are the favored medications, and as you go up the tiers, they become more obstacleized for the patient to get. So every insurance company has a different formulary, so you have to know when you write the prescription, or you have to have someone in your office telling you, or it can be on your electronic record, that you're actually writing a prescription that is covered by that patient's insurance company. Let's talk briefly about insurance coverage. There's two broad kinds, commercial and, and public. Uh, in our world, the majority of our patients are going to be on a public policy, primarily Medicare. Some of us uh, will see Medicare patients, and some will see TRICARE patients, which is uh, military coverage. Uh, commercial plans primarily are managed care plans now. There are very few old-time indemnity plans, um, and their qualified uh, health plans are those that are under Obamacare. And we're not, we're not sure where they're going or what's happening to them. Medicare covers patients over 65 years old, patients who are d disabled, uh, and patients who are, have end-stage renal disease. There are some Medicare patients who are what's called dual covered, and those are patients who uh, basically have Medi Medicaid secondary. Now, Medicare comes in four flavors. 
all Medicare patients have Part A automatically. Part A covers all hospital-based services. Part B, Part B covers uh, physician-based services, primarily outpatient, although if you see a patient in the hospital, it's billed under Part B. All physician-administered services, x-rays, ancillary services, x-rays, injections, infusions, those are all covered under Part B. Now, Medicare covers 80% of those costs. We'll, I have a slide coming up that will show that, but covers 80% of those costs. So if you, if you are 65 years old, I just happen to be rough, roughly 65 years old, um, I can purchase um, Part B coverage. Part A comes automatically, and the minimum fee we'll see is $104 a month. Um, and it goes up, it's, me, it's what's called means tested. That means that if you have higher income, you will pay a higher monthly fee. That covers 80% of the Medicare charge. All Medicare procedures, whether it's an office visit, whether it's an injection, whether it's surgery, has a code, and that code is paid at a predefined rate that is geographically adjusted. So it's not as if we can set a fee. We accept the fee. By participating in Medicare, you accept that fee. If you bill an office visit with level four and you get an approved uh, Medicare rate of $102 or whatever it is, they will send you a check for $80, 80% of it. The patient is responsible for 20% of that fee. And the patient can either pay it out of pocket or they can buy a what's called a Medigap policy, which is another type of insurance that covers that 20%. So that for m my wife and I, we have a Medigap policy, and if I go to the doctor, uh, I pay um, actually a deductible for the year of $160, and then after that, after that, my policy covers the 80%, and the Medigap policy covers the 20% so I have no out-of-pocket expenses. Part um, C is actually not a public, um, public company, it's a private company. It's a commercial enterprise that is basically a managed Medicare product. So those, it's either HMO or PPO, and fees are, it's, it's basically a, it's a, it's a bundled payment. Medicare gives a specific dollar amount to that, organ that commercial organization to cover the X patient for X amount of time. Actually, it's a yearly fee, and it covers all services. And I contract as a private specialist with that Medicare Advantage plan for care for their patients at a certain rate. Most of these Medicare Advantage plans will come to a practice like ours and say, <coughs> will, will you see our patients as specialists uh, but we'll give you 80% of Medicare uh, fee for service. And you can accept it or you can negotiate it. We, we negotiate a different fee because we won't accept uh, that kind of payment. So we, we, we either get 100% of Medicare from the Medicare Advantage or we don't see their patients. Uh, and that varies from practice to practice. Oops. Part D is the prescription coverage plan. That is a separate plan. It's another commercial enterprise. It, too, will have um, formularies with preferred drugs. It's a bit broader and a little easier, um, and it's a separate fee. I pay about $70 a month for Part D coverage, and that covers most of the medicines that I need. Uh, actually, what most people do, what I did, is when I'm getting my Medicare policy, I investigate all of the different Part D plans, whether it's United or Humana or whatever plan is available, and you can plug in your medications to the formula, and it'll tell you which plans cover which medications. And it's sort of an easy way to decide which, which plan D to, to get. The problem is that they, change, they can change from year to year. So your medications can change, and your, your co-pays on the different classes of medicine can change. But Part D is the Medicare prescription drug coverage. Medicare Advantage Part C does not have a Part D. It automatically covers drugs. 
as part of as part of that plan and part of that premium. The problem there is it's much, much more, more restrictive for your patients. Those who are on Medicare Advantage have often have huge copays for biologic drugs, for instance, that make it virtually untenable for them to get uh, a self-injectable drug. They just can't afford the copays because that formulary is structured that way. Hence the lower cost for patients for being under Medicare Advantage. It's much more, I, I, when patients ask me what they should do when they're turning 65, uh, should I go on a Medicare Advantage? And I said, yeah, it's a great plan. I said, oh, thank God, doctor, I, I was hoping you'd say that. I said, it's a great plan if you're not sick. Uh, if you're sick, then you've got lots of restrictions you've got to deal with to get the care that you need. So there is a sort of a coverage gap under Part D. Uh, actually, you pay, um, you pay a deductible. I think it's uh, about $100 for the year. And then you pay 25% of the cost of your medications up to $3,310. When your total drug cost meets that number, you go into what's called the donut hole or the coverage gap. And at that point, for branded drugs, uh, the government and the drug companies, the manufacturers, pick up about 55% of the cost of those drugs until you have reached $4,850 out of your pocket. Once you have spent $4,850 out of your pocket, uh, then you go into the catastrophic coverage phase in which you pay 5% of, of the retail cost. That coverage gap, the donut hole is closing over the next three years and in 2020, uh, I think it's not totally closed, but I think the patient uh, piece will be 25%, the government piece will be um, 25% and the manufacturer piece will be 50% of the coverage. So it is not in, unsubstantial. So if you got a, uh, a Medicare patient who is getting um, a self-injectable RA drug under Part D, okay, they've got to spend $4,850 out of their pocket before they're in the 5% coverage range. <clears throat> And there are lots of our patients who this is not tenable. And it makes it very difficult for us to get them their medications under Part D. Uh, <clears throat> so Part D and Part B, and it's important to know the distinction for your medications. Remember, Part D is pharmacy-filled medications, self-administered, oral, self-injectable medications. Part B benefits are medically administered medications. So all of the intravenous meds that we use for our diseases fall under Part B. It's a medical benefit. And if, you're, if your patient has a Medigap coverage, he is going to have full coverage under Part B. So a lot of times when we give patients, we, in our practice, we always discuss all treatment alternatives in a patient with RA and we present the options, self-injectable, infusible, oral, and the patients help us to make that decision. Uh, a lot of times, it, there's no decision if the patient's got Medicare because they can really only afford Part B drugs or infusible drugs uh, because it's very difficult for them to get to that $4,850. Uh, there are different ways that patients ob and we obtain medication especially pharmacy are primarily a route that uh, insurance companies use to get patients self-injectable meds. Uh, buy and bill uh, for many insurance companies and for Medicare is a method that we obtain uh, infusible drugs. We purchase the drugs and are reimbursed at um, what's called ASP or average sales price. Uh, by law it's plus 6%, but with the new sequ with sequestration which has been a, a budgetary uh, reduction in payment across the board uh, throughout the country, it comes out to about 4.4%. Uh, so the buy-in bill is for medications that are administered in the office and billed directly to the insurance company. Uh, the specialty pharmacy is a 
is a uh, way for patients to directly get their, their inject self-injectable medications. <clears throat> ah, the subject of PBMs. And this is a, uh, a real thorn for many of us in practice. <clears throat> and it's a focus that the CSRO is uh, working on for this year to expose the activities of PBMs. The idea started from the insurance company um, deciding that they needed help in managing the, their, their expenses in providing medications, particularly the, the growing ex growingly expensive medications to treat rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, cancer. So they, they, these other companies, ancillary companies, outsourced companies developed called Pharmacy Benefit Managers, or PBMs. And their job was to manage the cost and administration of these medications. And they were to be paid a fee uh, for doing this activity. They also were charged with negotiating drug pricing with pharmaceutical companies. So the insurance company would say to the PBM, all right, we want you to negotiate the price of drug X, get us the best deal uh, to lower our costs. And what transpired, what developed over time was a system of rebates. And the rebate, which we have, we have gently named a rebate, rebate kickback, uh, developed so that the PBM would say to company X, uh, we'll put your drug as a tier one, a favored drug, and in exchange for that, I guess it's not quite stated this way, but this is the way it looks to the outside. In exchange for that, you'll give us a rebate of 15, 20, 25% of the cost of the drug. Um, and this drives all of the things we're gonna talk about in a minute that create obstacles to us getting our patients on the medication that we want them on. Because that, that tier, that that favored status makes out other drugs non-favored. And it drives us to prescribe certain drugs first to our patients to be treated. And it creates havoc uh, in, this, in our system. Uh, the euphemism for this process for PBMs is called utilization management. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, prior authorizations are are almost universal now, and a prior authorization simply means that we, the office, the physician, have to jump through a hoop, a written hoop or a form, to tell the insurance company why we want our patient on this medicine. For instance, if the patient is on, patient, we want the patient on drug Y, and the formula says, nope, you can't be on drug Y unless you've been been on drug X, we've got a document with a form to the insurance company to say, okay, yes, the patient was on drug X from here to here, and then they'll approve. So it has to be approved prior to the dispensing of the drug. And that fail first system is called step edit. And you can see these are very common, very common uh, uh, procedures that insurance companies use to create obstacles and to funnel us to prescribe the drugs that are in the tiers that are most, they use least cost, we use most profitable for them. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a very quick story about an egregious activity that happened a few years ago with United Healthcare. 2012, there were two self-injectable drugs that they were negotiating with Drug A did a much better job of rebating and was tier one. Drug B was not so fortunate and became tier three. The patients who were already on drug B got a letter in the mail from United and it said, we want you to talk to your doctor about changing to a less expensive drug, tier, drug A. And um, they actually would cover drug B, but not provide a copay assistance, so essentially pushing the patients off of that drug to drug A. And we screamed and yelled and we made a little bit of progress. 
Two years later, the contracts run out. Drug B now does a much better drug, dr job of rebating and is now tier one, and drug A is now tier three. And those patients are now getting a letter saying, talk to your rheumatologist about switching to a less expensive agent. Well, it's not really less expensive. It's just more profitable because of the rebate for the insurance company. Uh, and they removed the, uh, actually they were not going to even allow patients to stay on drug B until we got involved and the ACR got involved and really screamed and yelled and wrote letters and had conference calls with them. And they relented and said, okay, we'll let grandfathering, it's called grandfathering when you let a patient stay on the drug they were on, we'll allow grandfathering, but we're not going to allow use of the copay card. Uh, so company B actually developed a plan to reimburse patients and it, it, it's worked out to some degree. Uh, but the point is the shenanigans and the things that go on external to the medical process create such obstacles for us that you have to understand how these things, how these things work and what you're going to be up against when you prescribe medicines for your patients. Um, once you um, prescribe the drug, uh, then you have to have someone do what's called benefit investigation. And in our office, we have uh, one and a half full-time people who do nothing but find out if the patient can get the drug. Now, the, most of the manufacturers also have, out, have other companies that help us do the same thing. But it's a real process. So I write the prescription. It goes to the, doesn't go to the pharmacy, it goes to the business office where we have someone who picks up the phone and either starts the process internally or calls the, the, the company and says, we have a patient the doctor wants on this drug. Here's the patient's name and social security number. Here's the demographics. And they do the investigation. And there are a number of, of outcomes that can occur after that investigation. Uh, first is the product is covered uh, without restriction. No problem. It's tier one. No problem, patient will be, it goes to the uh, specialty pharmacy, the specialty pharmacy processes and sends it uh, to the patient, assuming the patient can afford the copay on their, on their uh, approved drug. The second um, scenario is there are restrictions and you need a prior authorization, meaning did the patient take drug A first and fail? Did the, take, did the patient take methotrexate and have no response or was intolerant? That's, a, that's a, probably the most common one we see. You can't get to the biologic unless you've either failed or been intolerant of methotrexate. And the new wrinkle that we're seeing now is some of the companies are requiring dosage restrictions on methotrexate before they're allowed progression to a biologic. Um, so that's another obstacle that's being placed in front of us. Um, and if the product isn't covered, what then? Uh, and there are, ways, um, there are ways actually that we can get patients on drug even if it's not covered in their formulary. So these are sort of uh, ideas or things that you should follow when, uh, when you have a patient who has a drug that is covered with re restrictions. First of all, know what the restrictions are. As soon as the people in our office determine that that drug is covered with, with certain restrictions, I get a phone call or my secretary gets a phone call and it says, Here, here's, here's the rules that you have to follow, know the rules and um, make sure that you're applying the correct information to the insurance company uh, to, to, to get the patient their medication. You have to have supporting documents, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, including a prior authorization. There are deadlines. Uh, make sure your staff knows what those deadlines are. If you're a day late, your patient's not gonna get the medication. Uh, keep a copy of all your correspondence with the insurance company. Everything that you send, every telephone call that you make, log, uh, because lots of times the insurance company will say, what papers, what phone call? And if you're getting towards the end of the time period to get this approved, you're gonna be out of luck. Um, find out what the approval time period is. How long is it going to take? And you've got to keep records and copies of every communication with them. Um, they're not exactly trustworthy folks. And they're not very efficient, which is amazing. 
the insurance companies and the PBMs are terribly inefficient in helping us get medications for our, our uh, patients. So um, you've got to have You've got to have a clinical reason to do what you're doing, uh, and there's got to be document. You've heard the word documentation many times today. Your record has to clearly, clearly state what's transpired and why this drug needs to be given to the patient. So, if the patient has to fail two TNFs to get to a non-TNF, the record has to reflect that. The record has to say, patient was, the visits has to go in order and say. Patient returns not doing well. Uh, DAS score is this. Rapid three score is this. Uh, been on 90 days. We're switching to a second drug, and it has to reflect the clinical course of that patient, so that anybody at the insurance company can read this record and make the, the inference correctly that the patient has fulfilled the criteria to move to this drug. Uh, and again, these are, these are examples of things that uh, are good to have in your chart, particularly disease activity measures, um, SDI, CDI, DAS. How many do a DAS? Anybody do a DAS? When you get into private practice, your, your DAS days will be over. Uh, but there are other measures that, uh, that are easily done in the office, particularly with the HRs. Uh, certainly a rapid three. Uh, Rapid-3 is a good thing to do because the patient, it's a patient-reported form, uh, and that is going to satisfy certain, uh, I just found this out actually on Friday, certain clinical practice uh, improvement activity, CPIAs or IAs now, uh, because it, it is a shared decision-making uh, activity. Um, it doesn't have a joint count, and a CDI or an SDI probably will uh, satisfy that as well. So if you're dealing with, uh, with Wegener's or MPA, uh, again, it's got to document the appropriate things to assure that uh, the diagnosis is accurate. You're not, going to, you're not going to be approved for rituximab unless these kinds of things are on the chart uh, documenting the diagnosis and the clinical course. So if the product is not covered, then uh, we, we can appeal. And we are not appealing to their better instincts. Uh, we are appealing, appealing, uh, we're appealing to their medical instincts, which uh, sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. There are two kinds of appeals, written appeals and peer-to-peers. Peer-to-peers uh, peer tend to be more productive um, because you're actually talking to a human being, even though he may be a retired OBGYN who has no idea what uh, GPA means. Uh, he thinks it's his score in college. Um, so you do have to apile, compile, uh, you have to basically compile your documentation. Uh, all these things here is, is simply is a reflection of compiling the right documentation to support your reasons for wanting to get the patient onto that medication. You have to send it to the insurance company. You've got to make sure there's a record of your having sent it and received and you've got to follow up, as I said. They're not the most efficient organizations, and uh, you'd be surprised how many times they answer your question with another question, which is, what records are you talking about? So you've got to keep on top of it. They're not to be trusted. Uh, these are, this is a list of commonly requested documents. I don't have to read it to you, I'm sure. Uh, it's self-explanatory. You've got to have your basic initial visit, your, your H&P, your impressions, your lab, any supporting testing that you've done, and you've got to have the documentation of the clinical course of this patient. Um, the billing that you've done to show that you've, you've used, say, infusible drugs previously, uh, and all of the appeals documentation as well. So once you've done all that, and let's say the patient is finally approved for the drug, then the question is, can the patient afford the drug? Can the patient afford getting the medication? Does the patient have a Part B plan to cover the 20%? Is the patient in a Medicare Advantage plan where their co-pays and their co-insurance could be huge? Uh, is it a Part D drug and they, they're not, they can't get through the donut hole and, they, and the dollars are too much? So can the patient um, um, afford it? Now, this is, uh, this is just a, an example of 
Increasing tiers have increasing copays. So this is simply a reflection of favored versus non-favored status from the formulary. So if you're a tier one, if, if you, the drug is a tier one, it's a favored drug, and the coinsurance or copay is going to be less and more favorable to the patient. And as the tiers go up, the copays and the coinsurance will be increasing to actually create more obstacles for the patient getting the drug and to make up for the difference in, I presume, the difference in rebates uh, in the system. So again, this is the Medicare cost for 2016. It was $104 a month for Part B. Uh, the deductible is $166. Coinsurance uh, is 20% and can be covered with a Medigap policy. Part D varies from plan to plan, and it varies from your usage. So my initial cost for my, my Part D over the past five years has gone up as I've been on more medications. So it's uh, means tested and it's usage tested to some degree. So what's happened, um, uh, I'm not gonna go through all this, but uh, what it really shows is that there has been a decrease in adherence and persistence uh, and even getting the drugs uh, by patients as their, it's called cost sharing, as cost sharing has increased their responsibility in getting medications. So we've seen all of these adverse effects on patients being able to be treated as the cost of the drugs and the cost of the cost sharing has increased for our patients. So one of the things that most of us don't like to do but have to do is talk to the patients about their financial part of this uh, equation uh, we have to do it, A, because the patients need to know and need to be able to tell us if it's feasible, uh, and we need to know if we're going to have to change their medication. So we have to discuss the financial responsibility with the patient early. We have to know what their coverage is. Uh, and then we, if the patient says, you know, Doc, I, I, that's just beyond my means. I, I, there's no way I can afford that drug. Then we've got to look for ways to assist them, if possible, in getting in getting. Uh, financial assistance to cover the drug. So there are different, different groups of patients who have different abilities to get different uh, modes of assistance. If the patient is commercially insured, if the patient has Blue Cross Blue Shield or United, it's going to be pretty easy uh, because most of the manufacturers will have a copay card or some copay assistance. So if the patient's uh, responsibility for their self-injectable is $200 a month, uh, they will get a card uh, or the pharmacy will get a card that will cover almost all of that. Uh, and their, their responsibility may be fairly small or zero. If they have a self-infusible, uh, if they have an office infusible medication, that, that too could be helped by copay cards for commercial, commercially insured patients. However, if you have a uh, if you're a federally insured patient, if you're in a federal program, then it's illegal to accept any kind of uh, formal assistance from a manufacturer to obtain your drug. So uh, there are ways that have been developed to help help patients, even even though there are legal restrictions. And this is by the establishment of foundations. So manufacturers can funnel money to foundations which can then have patients apply to them. The copay card doesn't usually require uh, any means testing, but in the federal programs, the foundations require that patients apply and there are thresholds of income and uh, that, that uh, patients have to meet in order to get the assistance. If you have no insurance and you're not of means, then you have no problem because every manufacturer has a program to supply drugs for those patients. In West Palm Beach, we, for the past 42 years, uh, our practice has run a free clinic through the Arthritis Foundation. And we do it one morning a month, and we see patients with RA and lupus. We don't really see OA or fibromyalgia. And we have absolutely no problem getting those people treated with biologics uh, through 
uh, donations from, from the manufacturers. So if you have no insurance, uh, then you really are, I guess you're not really in good shape, but uh, you, you have more access to getting treated uh, through the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, this is uh, just a, a, a depiction of the different places that one can administer uh, infusible medications for RA and other diseases. You can do it in the office setting. They can be referred out to a hospital or a freestanding infusion center. And I think that's really uh, just again, uh, just to finish, to reiterate the need for records to reflect what you're doing and why you want to do it. And the last thing is audits. I think uh, Jean and uh, Ethel both mentioned uh, audits. Uh, you need to be prepared to have audits at any time. Um, and your records uh, should be pre-examined. We have a uh, Jean's company uh, do, a, do audits on all of our records to make sure we're in compliance so that if we do get audited that uh, we're in we're, we're in good shape. So I'll stop there and answer any questions. You mentioned about the uh, interest of the, the college of nursing practitioners. But for example, uh, people, you know, this morning, I don't see people that are being interested in the thing at all. Did you guys try, uh, try the methotrexate to, to a oh, well, dosage? Uh, restriction on methotrexate. Yeah, the insurance company requires something dosage. fairly new that some of the so, some of the obstacles have been made to. If you treat a patient with 10 milligrams of methotrexate or 15 milligrams, it may not be enough to get approval to move a patient to a biologic. Uh, some of the insurance companies are are looking at 20 and 25 milligrams. Anybody else seen that? I'd yeah, it's been on the ACR listserv uh, the last couple of weeks, actually. Yeah, I, I heard that um, a, a room told you that I know that she got denied uh, that this patient was on 20 milligram for more than like three to four months on triple therapy. And uh, the insurance company denied that she was not on the 25 milligram for three months when she did not, uh, the patient did not respond at all to triple therapy for, for uh, a few months. And I, I did not, I, is it even in, legal uh, for the insurance company ask that because um, well, we, we've, I, we've, I felt that that's very uh, um, well, unethical and illegal. <laughs> well, we've been making the argument for a number of years when these things come up that the insurance companies are basically practicing medicine. Uh, and we've made that argument in letters and, and conference calls with the medical directors. Uh, it generally falls on deaf ears and I don't think it's been challenged in the courts. Uh, I don't think it's, it's been to, uh, there's been no lawsuit that I know of. Uh, but I will tell you that sometimes these policies come out, they are egregious, and a lot of us start screaming, writing letters, and sometimes you can get them to back down and, and, and change it. Uh, it has happened. Uh, and the ACR Insurance Committee is now very active uh, looking at these things, so if any of these things come up, you should contact uh, uh, Sean, Sean Faraday in uh, North Carolina, who's chair of the ACR Insurance Committee. Fahey. Fahey. Uh, or contact us, uh, and we will look into it and pursue it. But uh, the, the worst thing we can do for our patients is just, just sit down and let these things happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.